<clears throat> Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone, um, for coming today. We'll call the meeting to order. <clears throat> Before we get into uh, the declarations of conflict of interest or anything like that, the agenda, <clears throat> it's, uh, it's the Chief's last committee meeting. <clears throat> and uh, heard a rumor that uh, you're done tomorrow. Is tomorrow officially your last your last day? I have holidays. So my last, my last day. <clears throat> last day in the office. Yeah. So the boxes yeah. are all packed and no, not yet. That still has to be done. All the trophies yeah. and we'll get it medals and. <laughs> <clears throat> well, chief, I just want to say uh, on behalf of the city, thank you um, for the many years of service, the professionalism that you showed, and um, and the heart that you showed. <clears throat> I think this the residents of the city are are certainly lucky to have you. Um, and had you for the, the years that we did. <clears throat> we want to wish you all the best with retirement. Um, enjoy it. And um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I said earlier today we were talking, it was, you, you, don't, uh, you, don't, you don't stick around as long as I have unless you're working with some, some good, good quality people. And that's not just within the walls of the police facility, but that city hall council. Uh, just, you know, I've had a I've had a good run and I've worked with some work work with and, and been a part of some phenomenal people. So I, I uh, you know, like I say you can't uh, you can't really do what you do what you do without having that kind of support too. So yeah, thank you, <clears throat> Councillor Duran. Anything you want to add before we get into the agenda? Well, that's just great, Greg. And then I just want to you know say the same words that you did. Thank you very much to the chief, and we appreciate all his hard work over the years. So thank you, and, and good luck in the future. Thanks, Bob. Councilor McLeod. <clears throat> Listen, there's you know, nothing more can be said. We're, we're certainly going to miss you. Um, you know, your personality uh, as a person, uh, how you handle things, uh, cool and calm, collective all the time. So uh, we certainly will miss you. There's lots of people out there that can come in, but, you know, not, uh, not having your character. So thank you very much for all the years of service. Thank you. Your Worship? He's going to miss us. <laughs> Your Worship, anything you want to add? Especially one, but anyways, I won't give the name. But I do want to say that uh, this chief worked under two Browns, my brother Richard and myself. And I know back in God, 2002, sure get a bonus. 2003, when we were working on the legislation to change the laws regarding bootleggers, this gentleman right here did a lot of the work uh, behind the scenes. And the legislation that was passed in the House, I think, was... Uh, great contributing factor from this chief. Uh, I remember going up to see your chief and he said, Philip, just leave us alone, we'll get it done. So the legislation did go through and the, the, the rest of the story is history. Did you, did you work under your grandfather too? That, no, my great grandfather. Yeah. <laughs> that was prohibition, that was prohibition, that was a wild man. Wow, chief. <laughs> when it got a little too bad, we won't get into that. Yeah. But thank you very much, Chief. Thank you. Thank you. All right, meeting adjourned. No joke. <laughs> All right, any dark races of conflict? All right, seeing none, can I get approval of the agenda, please? Moved? Second right here. Okay, thank you. All right, adoption of the minutes from the February 23rd meeting. Moved by the mayor, seconded by Councillor McLeod. Thank you. Any business arising from the minutes? <clears throat> All right, seeing none, let's move right into reports. So we'll start with fire operational, and I guess, Chief, you're going to take care of both. I don't know. Thank you, Chair. All right. Uh, the operational report uh, is ending from February 18th to March 18th of this year. Uh, total fire inspections were 36, follow up fire inspections were 11. Complaint inspection four, uh, inspection for the compliance order <coughs> issue for 13. Uh, there was one uh, court order uh, as well. There were five uh, files closed. Plans review, permits and safety plans, consultations, there were nine. Some of your offense tickets was one issued. Uh, fire investigations, there were three. <coughs> emergency responses, there were a total of 56 emergency calls. District one had 31, district two had 21. And there were also uh, four callers for fire inspectors. Uh, during the time period of training, uh, members participated in a variety of both physical and theory training and uh, touch training, including topics such as JPR drill, RIP training, ventilation, fire control, smoke reading, and company drills and CPR. Uh, activity for the department uh, during the month, the change of clock, change of battery, which was held back at McDonald's on March 13th, firefighters were present to make uh, smoke alarm batteries. 
So uh, overall, they, they were kept fairly busy for, for, for the month. Good now, job, Chief. with the other little bit of report I'd like to, like to share, some more information. Uh, the former Engine 1, which is the 2000 metal bed, if you recall over the last meet meetings, it was sent over to the boss for repair, auto body repair. <coughs> since it's come back and is now in service, which is great. Everybody's pleased with the work. Uh, ladder 1, uh, it's gone through the design phase. All the engineering design work from the new ladder truck is done. Uh, I spoke with them this morning, so we're right on par for that. And we'll probably look for delivery in late fall. <coughs> uh, negotiations currently ran through about six times uh, with the local and uh, we continue to negotiate with recent dates to be determined. Uh, the 1989 fire truck, which is the hub, and uh, it's been decommissioned, it's still sitting at station one ready to, get, uh, to go to public works. Uh, the emergency generator project, uh, hopefully in a month's time, <coughs> we should be ready to go to tender, which would be great. Um, the new fire station. Uh, the executive team still uh, works with architects and developing the space summary. That's ongoing work. And uh, we'll just as I said this morning in another previous meeting, and the fire department would extend the congratulations to Chief Paul Smith for his retirement. <coughs> so that concludes the report. Thanks, Chief. Fire prevention bylaw in review, that's nothing's really changed from, from last month. <coughs> We're just kind of advancing it on. <coughs> The file is still very active, still collecting information, uh, and it's still going forward. Okay. So hopefully by summer we'll be able to have uh, a presentation here for committee to be able to, to walk you through. Perfect. <clears throat> All right. Thank you. Any questions for the chief? Can I just make one point, uh, Mr. Chair? Yep. Um, the incident down at 302 Richmond Street uh, did attract some public attention because of the condition of the building. Uh, I spoke to Kent Mitchell, who was with the fire services, and uh, he sent the <coughs> statement that was uh, prepared by your department chief on the whole situation that took place down there. Um, I think there was a lot of misunderstanding of what was going on down there. The fire, fire services, along with uh, planning and development department, were working with the landlord for the last six months, trying to make, you know, make it work, but in the end, Fire had to make a decision that if these people were not removed, their lives were definitely in danger. After I get the story from Kent of what the place was, the condition of that building at 302 Richmond. So I think some of the media that was around the whole situation that the city lacked any concern about the residents was totally untrue after speaking to fire service. So I really appreciate that it was followed up and it was acted on professionally and I think I believe that people that do speak out on Twitter and, and other social media forms should actually try to search out the, the information before they make comments so just pass it on to Kent that, and I know you I'm sure are part of that media release but the professionalism from the department fire services and professionalism <coughs> from our planning and development department were very appreciative I'll pass on your version with your worship. Thank you. You're right, your worship. It's it's a sensitive topic, especially with, with, with the housing situation yeah. in Charlottetown right now. But at the same time, when, we, when we're aware of something that's unsafe, <clears throat> that puts residents of Charlottetown at risk, you, you, can't turn, you can't turn a blind eye to those things. You can you work with them as much as you can work with them. And if there's, there's no willingness on the other side, then it's, it's, it's difficult and puts us in, in, in precarious spots. So. Right. <clears throat> Again, I echo your comments. As yep. Kent said, this was a, a, life, uh, uh, a life safety code issue, right. and, but the department worked <clears throat> closely with the landlord, and that showed that we were cooperating, collaborating, and in the end, we had to exercise uh, <clears throat> caution over just turning a blind eye to it. So I think it was well done. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. Uh, Councilor McLeod, any? No, I'm good. Thank you. Councilor Duran, any questions for the Chief? No, well, good, sir. Okay. All right, Chief, thank you very much. I was going to put you on the spot anyways and ask if you wanted to say something to the Chief, please, before he left. <laughs> but you already did, so <clears throat> it's all about public shame, embarrassment, <laughs> roasting. <clears throat> all right. On to bylaws. Uh, bylaws is the, is the uh, work that's been underway with the Greg Taxi Bylaws. That's been found. Can you please update on that? 
Yeah, so um, a couple things is that we've been part of um, a subcommittee uh, working with the uh, Council of Disabilities, uh, Councilor McLeod, uh, myself, uh, Your Worship, um, to, um, to expand the accessible taxi uh, capacity in our city and province. Um, as part of that, um, I was asked to reflect on some, some bylaws in the region and make some recommendations on changes. Um, I have, I'm going to hand out a sheet here with what we think are the appropriate changes necessary for, the, for our bylaw to uh, be implemented to get us on a, a starting footing for accessible taxis. I'm just going to hand it in. These are So accessible taxis, um, certainly there is a gap, a recognized gap in our, uh, in our city and province. Um, but if we are going to, uh, as a city, endorse and, and, uh, and uh, promote accessible taxis, I think it's the responsible thing to do to get our bylaws in line that we can uh, regulate them like we do other taxis. And uh, so these, these uh, recommendations are, are started in doing that, and as the industry evolves or, or builds, we may, you know, look at implementing others. But we didn't. We wanted to start off with a, a responsible approach, but not make it too limiting, where it would deter people from wanting to uh, get into the program. So, um, if anyone has any questions, uh, concerns, uh, so uh, let me know. Um, the next step in this process, if. if Committee, committee is okay with the chair is that um, we would take uh, some or all of these recommendations put them into a resolution form and uh, take it for first reading to council yep <clears throat> Brad I do have a quick question for you so yeah. like Pat and the Elephant for instance a separate organization would they would they fall under this type of bylaw the taxi bylaw are they totally separate when it comes to transporting people with disabilities yeah they, they would they <coughs> Pat the Elephant is not one of our taxi stands except currently right but that's Helen. but but it wouldn't fall under the same no. rule so we wouldn't expect them to no they, they would be able to as a, to take advantage of some of the sponsorship from the province yeah. <coughs> we're not going to regulate them these are these these regulations are meant for the the current taxi industry that are looking to uh, change their fleet or modify the fleet or maybe a startup business that are that's going to cater to um, Accessible, you know, taxi. So that um, Elvin does not fall into that. Will this apply to the the new? Um, I think it's called um, carry. <coughs> so, so like the Uber type uh, no, business. No. This doesn't apply either no. to that. And it We're doesn't not. apply to anyone outside the city either. Okay. Right. So that's the. <coughs> yeah. Go ahead. Sure. Um, yeah. So. I first want to say thanks to, to Deputy Chief. Uh, um, this might seem just like one piece of paper. But he's done a lot of work on this since, since we started. And, uh, you know, he searched out other municipalities and he gave us a whole lot of information. And, and we don't want to make it too complicated either for, for, for the taxis because we all know that, uh, you know, things are change is, is uh, it's not something everybody <laughs> wants to do. So we're, we're trying to make this as friendly as we can. But at the same time, it's got to be a safety uh, oriented. Uh, Project and, and Pat and the Elephant, by the way, Mr. Chair, is involved. They are part of the committee, and uh, they're they're willing to do the training for the taxi cabs for free as well. And, and uh, they've searched out uh, some of the uh, the installation side of it and, and uh, how how insurances will come on board. And so it, it's a it, it's a great project. Think of the province and, and the person with disabilities seeing the need uh, for for this infrastructure that uh, you know. Everyone deserves the right to be able to get down and get home. So it, it's it's a really nice, uh, <coughs> a nice project, and we're hoping that uh, the police can be uh, 
uh, adopts these uh, bylaws so that it makes it safe. Uh, there is some taxes that are operating in different parts of the province on their own, and, and uh, I don't think I want to be sitting in them. And so it, these bylaws are very important, and uh, it's critical that we uh, provide a safe uh, means for people to transport. So, so thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor McLeod. So I'm assuming that that taxi operators were part of this committee as well, and they're <coughs> buy-in from them. They were certainly invited to be part of the discussion. <coughs> okay, so, but they didn't, they weren't part of it. So no. I, I guess I'm just trying yes. to gauge, or, or is there gonna be any recourse or backlash from the operators on this when we do? I think it's a good idea, don't get me wrong, I just wanna kind of. <coughs> well, it, it, it's, it's only applicable to those that are getting into the accessible taxi. Uh, so they're, they're going to, uh, like right now, none of the, I'm not aware of any of the current uh, stands or, or operators that have accessible taxis. And so, but if they choose to enter into the program, um, then they will have to fall in line with these conditions. So, um, uh, but um, as being part of the committee, I am aware of, of considerable outreach that was done to the, to the industry to, uh, to engage them, um, but you know, as you're aware, Chair, in the past, we've it's, been, it's a challenging dynamic uh, there. So, is there any way was it talked about around incentivizing this a little bit for the taxi operators to do this, to offer the service? I mean, it's a great service and a service that's needed. Mm -hmm. Is there a way to? So, so the, I guess you want me to answer. Yeah. Other, other than the free training, I'm just talking about is there anything and there other incentives for? the taxi operators to move forward with doing well um, we're, we're hoping that uh, we didn't really talk about last night is what the city of Charlottetown is uh, wanting to top up what's what is available there for those that are wanting to try and do it in Charlottetown but the idea is that uh, the government has felt there's a need the city has felt there's a need um, for this service and we're just hoping that one of the taxi and even just one maybe right? the, the province is hoping to have 10 across the province and we're hoping that through through time, once this program gets rolled out a little more, that they'll get more you know, more information to be shared with the taxi companies. The mayor himself has ran has run twice twice at nine o'clock at night running around trying to catch up to all these cab companies to give them the information flyers and, and uh, uh, but the incentive is that th this program will pay for a majority chunk of what it cost to have the, the, the installed. And then the other piece is that you know that they think that their fares are going to be affected by having this this ramp and, and where we're trying to say no it's not but we have professionals that will tell you and once you go through the training that you can still carry three or four people in your cab so that's the the, the stumbling block i think yeah. once we talk more communicate more and uh, we're going to do a couple of demos um, um we're going to borrow one of these vans and, and, and show and, and uh, do some more promotion with persons with disabilities from our share and, and eventually over time this isn't a rush it's a two-year uh, goal is to get people on and the taxi companies on board to once they see that how, how these things will operate and it's not as hard as they have it made out to be and, and mr chair if i could just <coughs> add uh, cody uh, clinton is the provincial government rep they are putting ninety thousand dollars on the table over a two-year period providing up to 20 percent funding to a max of ten thousand <coughs> to the in, in for the purchase of the at the lifts yeah um, <coughs> summerside United Summerside Taxi, they have five of these uh, vehicles, but just remember, Summerside doesn't have Pat the Elephant. So there's a, there's a market there, and uh, the province has asked us to top it up by adding 10,000. So I think we committed 10,000 from your budget. I don't know where you're gonna find it, but. This, the only reason I'm asking, uh, the only reason why I'm asking the questions is this is, I, I have not been kept in the loop at all on this. This is the first time I'm seeing this. <coughs> so, uh, so as chair, like I said, just I'm okay, I, sorry, but <coughs> it's, sorry, Mr. Chair. Um, so this is really a provincial campaign. It's not our. It's not. It's not our. Uh, you know. So we met as a just a, a, a ad hoc group. The ad hoc group, and and and, and now it's the point where we're ready to bring something that would be worth. Your yeah, yeah. No, no. I, I don't yeah, disagree. So I don't think it's a bad idea. I just yeah. Like I said, just, it's just new to me, that's all. And, and uh, there'll be, we're going to do some, uh, there'll be some marketing where you'll be involved in, uh, and, and, and uh, to, to enhance this and try to get some taxis in Charlotte and do on board. And actually, I believe one of the constituents that is on the committee is Paul Cudmore. I think he's from Ward 7, or Ward 8 now. Mm -hmm. Paul Cudmore was the driving force 
behind this whole issue after the incident down at the Royal Canadian <coughs> Legion yeah. last winter. And it, it's just taken off from there. And so I appreciate what Paul has done yeah. in his first hand experience. Mm -hmm. But as the chair, as Mr. Chair, as, as <coughs> Councillor McLeod said, this is still evolving and any more going forward will definitely involve mm -hmm. you as chair of police and protective services. Yeah, no, I think it's good. I think it's a great idea. Okay. That's all my questions. I just wanted to. So could I ask, are we planning to bring the amendments to the taxi bylaw? At the April meeting of council? If they're ready. <coughs> What's that? I said if they're ready. Yeah, so it's just a matter of drafting these into a resolution form. I can, and uh, okay, we'll bring it forward. So I do have one slight uh, suggestion on fares. To start off, other than standard taxi fares, no additional fees shall be charged. That way it does clarify that further. Yes. So it's other than standard taxi fares, no additional fees shall be charged. <coughs> You're adding that to it? Yes, sir. So if the committee agrees, <coughs> it just clarifies it further. That time. Is that okay with? Yeah, I, I'm okay with it. I mean, uh, we're trying to, you know, it's, it's not intended to be a, uh, a grab either, right? It's, it's intended to provide the same service. At the same price. At the same price. Yeah, and that, right? yeah. that just clarifies that point. Yeah, that's the point. Hmm. Okay. And that'll cover by adding that change to it. Correct? What's that? That'll cover that standard fee by adding what Mr. Kelly suggested. Yep. yep. We're good with that change? Yeah. Councilor Drawn, good with that change? Okay. <clears throat> All right. Perfect. So, is that it for bylaws? Yeah. Okay, moving on to personnel. Personnel items, Chair, there's a few things uh, with regard to vacancies. We have the vacancy for our reception ticket first position. Interviews have been held. We're now doing the uh, security screening process, and I think that pretty much wrapped up yesterday. Yes, it did. Yeah. Yeah. So that'll go back to HR, and there should be an offer letter going out shortly. So that that, uh, that piece is done. Good. Uh, we worked with HR to help them uh, in terms of looking at the process for, uh, for the chief's replacement. Uh, so they've got some things on that. For, they'll be looking at that in early April, is what I understand from from uh, the HR. Um, Chief, what's do you know what the what's what's the hope to have that position filled by? Uh, well, it, there, there'd have to be an interview process, and then you have to do the screening piece. I mean, at the end of the day, depending on how quickly you can get that done, you you could in theory have it done and ready to roll by first May or before. Okay. Yeah. Um, <coughs> Yeah, it just depends on, the, on, on the, how the process unfolds. Okay. okay. <clears throat> um, do, 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 do. Uh, just to give share a little bit of, uh, we had this a, a situation involve in late February, where a chap walked down the ramp of Peak Ski, went out on the water, and, and uh, went out on the ice, and then ended up in the water. So we had two of our members down and, and recovered the individual and uh, as, as luck had it, he was a little bit hypothermic, but thanks to the actions of Constables Gallant and McGrath, one of our part-time people, they uh, were able to take to uh, recover that individual, get him to the hospital and had a good outcome. So we had uh, a pretty good thing that happened there. So we can give you that for the next next. Awesome, All right. really good. Uh, other than that, the other couple of things in, is the, uh, the APA contract. There's really no updates on that from last month. We haven't had any any uh, discussions, uh, or if there's no. I think uh, uh, Bethany had mentioned something this morning about the potential for uh, discussions in June uh, to get that launched off. So anyway, not a lot, a lot of advancement in terms of the uh, the, the union contract. And just as an information item, the union has launched. Uh, there's there's two or three surveys going on all at the same time, but anyway, uh, the city has its has its survey. The uh, the province opened a, a survey on the on the uh, midpoint police review that launched yesterday on the government website. Anyway, the union is just doing an internal survey of the membership with regard to health and wellness. So they they launched that the other day. So they'll be pulling some some information on that. That's just an information in case you hear anything on that. So that is basically it from the personnel side. Any questions for the chief? Councilor Duran, any questions? All good, Chair. Okay. 
All right, thanks, Chief. Moving on to mental health. Okay, on the mental health front, we've had some discussions with regard to how the process is going to unfold with the mobile mental health. As you, uh, you, you may or may not have heard in the, in the news a week or so ago, things have changed some, somewhat in terms of how the province is going to roll that out. They now have, uh, uh, on the EMS is actually managing the, the, this, the, uh, the, the, the mental health file, I guess, for lack of a better term. They are, uh, will be looking after the, the, uh, the call line and they will also be managing the, the mobile response unit. Police will not be involved in the mobile response unit. As we had been planning, we won't be doing that. They haven't rolled, they haven't, they haven't publicly stated that yet, okay. but that's in all likelihood how it's gonna unfold, is the mental health units will be staffed by, by mental health personnel, EMS, EMS personnel. If they need police, based on how they triage it, we will still go like we do now, but we won't actually be part of that mental health unit. They will help to train all police officers across the province in terms of de-escalation techniques sneaks and that kind of stuff so there's going to be additional training they were going to front the cost for that they did when we were having discussions initially um, make reference to the costing and that kind of thing um, they have verbally said they will honor honor their commitment to fund a position but only for a year okay so Basically, that'll help cover some of the costs that we do in terms of the, the calls that we do and that kind of thing. But you know, it, it may work for this year, but it won't be going forward because we won't actually be part of that unit. Okay. There's some other things that they can spend some money on that we've we've suggested they really carefully consider and look at. It's a it's a product called Health I M, which is a which is a, a uh, an app. It's it's a secure secure medical app that, that other agencies in Ontario and elsewhere use. Um, totally encrypted, there's information that goes back and forth to the hospital and all that kind of stuff. If they were to look at that and roll it out, uh, I'm not sure what the cost would be, it would be cheap, uh, but it certainly would be cheaper than putting, paying for a, a, a whole lot of bodies year over year over year. Um, and the experience in Ontario now is where they have on average would deal with a mental health situation and have to take someone to hospital and spend Prior to, for these agencies that use this platform now, prior to having the platform, would spend four hours and a bit at hospital with an individual, and that would be two officers. The use of the Health IM tool, because it triages and puts things to the hospital right away in, in medical language, they know before people get there, that four hour window has now been reduced to an average of about an hour and 41 minutes. Wow. <coughs> There are there, so there are some some positives to it. It's a question of whether they'll, they'll look at that. But okay. Yeah, so we have planned that seed. So we'll see where that goes. All right. Good. Any questions? Good. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Jason, what's Chair, uh, just a few things. Um, we were involved with the Dell Moolah Sock. Thing that went on last week. Uh, mainly, we helped them with traffic on the roundabout and did our part to make sure everyone got in and out of there safely. Uh, along those lines, our community traffic enforcement was busy on uh, in school areas and crosswalks. We handed out a lot of tickets. We did some direct enforcement as far as uh, having a plain clothes officer walking or trying to walk across crosswalks with with uh, you know targeted vehicles to lay the charge, so I think we were up around 40, 40, 50 charges over the course of the month, so there was, there was a, a need for that and we addressed it. Um, number of officers, including myself, uh, participated in, in an indigenous blanket exercise. Some of you might be aware of those. Uh, it was productive. And uh, we also participated in a intimate partner regional workshop where they wanted uh, municipal police opinion on uh, some of the policy they're going to put forward. Okay. <coughs> hey, Deputy Coombs, any questions? The deputy? Uh, yeah, I do. Mr. Yeah. Um, so should that be something we should, um, the, the sidewalk, the uh, cars not stopping for people in the crosswalks and that should be perhaps advertise that? But we, uh, I don't think, it's kind of one of the things I get a bit, but how do we let the public know that? That there's a responsibility as a driver that if someone's in the crosswalk, you should stop. 
Well, we did we did put it on our uh, website. That is on the website. Is it okay? Yes, it is. Yeah, we okay. uh, put on the website that we had, where we did it, the dates and the amount of charges that were laid, okay. and, and a reminder to the public. Because it was quite phenomenal in matter of numbers, right? Like, yeah. yeah. Like yeah. I was never thought it would be that. It was that boys and girls club where we were having an issue there, and uh, it was amazing how many how many cars were signed. Right. They just wouldn't sign up with people. And then we did, uh, yeah. and then we did speeding fractions, yeah. fractions at uh, some of the other schools. Yeah. And stuff, so that's weird. Yeah, it was great. Great to hear. I think on St. Peter's Road, we showed like our site visit. To, yes. Yeah. You know, it shows the need for that part, that change, physical change yeah. there. Uh, no, no it's good policing for sure. Yeah. Yes. Just to follow up with Councilor McLeod saying, you know, I, I know many of us have watched pedestrians just crossing without yeah. looking both yeah. ways. Yeah. It was a great one thing that we did at Prince Street, yeah. cross street, look both ways. But this harmonization amongst walkers, drivers, Sorry. and riders, it has to get better. That, that's not our responsibility, that's the community's responsibility. <laughs> and. Uh, just, I was watching ATV news last night, uh, a doctor, uh, actually it was a medical doctor that also taught at Dow, was hit at an intersection in Halifax a couple of weeks ago, died. And uh, the driver didn't yield to the pedestrian and hit him. And uh, you know, you're, you're right, it's, we're, we're fortunate right to this point that we haven't had a death at one of our intersections, but. Halifax had a real They've had a real a big real issue. Quinto Road and some different places, so it's good that we're taking a, a proactive. A proactive. But then there's also, some of it falls on responsibility of the pedestrian too. I mean, you've got the cell phones and the headphones <laughs> yeah. and, and the hoodies on. Yeah. 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 So it's a two-way street. And, yeah. yeah. and, and Deputy Coombs, we, we received a criticism of the, inter, the modifications we did to the uh, intersection. Uh, in front of the uh, uh, 1911 jail, like, but I know my brother, who's been driving that road with our heavy equipment, people just walk right across. Mm -hmm. At yeah. least now we're in a pedestrian refuge mm -hmm. that it, it, it does allow drivers to say, "Whoa, yeah. like yeah. you have to stop." But well, um, it narrows it down, so it kind of so it kind of slows you mm -hmm. at the same time as far as motorists. It has two purposes. But you're right. The other Correct. part is, I mean, you, you see that, and you'll see it over here with Gene Canfield is. Pedestrians just, they, they don't, when you have four lanes, they don't make eye contact with the driver. Correct. You know, they just step off the curb and keep on trucking and figure, well, they, you, you saw me. And it, to a certain extent, in a lot of instances, when you watch them, they never push the activation lines, no, they right. just go. Well, they don't think they have to. It's a crosswalk, so you should be able to just walk without looking both ways. Yeah. I think there's a response. There's an onus on both. All of us. Yeah. yeah. Sharing, yeah. sharing the roads. Uh, and mm -hmm. cyclists as well. Yeah. That's, that's where we're employing yeah. our e-watch cameras a lot too. Um, so every time there's a pedestrian that's struck by a vehicle or a bike is struck by a car, you, we're always looking to see if it's captured on e-watch and a lot of times it is because it's happened in major intersections and we're getting the, the story behind it that it was either the pedestrian who was at fault or the driver. Oh, the driver. So, mm -hmm. so the, the true victim is is being called out and the accused is being called out thanks to the cameras. Otherwise, you need witnesses and a lot of times you're not there. So right. that's working out with e-watch. So is a lot of the problem around speed? Is it around, is it around cell phone usage? Is it around just ignorance? Like a combination of all? combination of different things. Like in some places, like the, the whether or not you could, like the, 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 new, the new pedestrian lights that, that are really bright and, and down lower, right? Really jump out at you. Yeah. you. Places like Ellens Creek, where you have a crosswalk a little beyond the intersection, the intersection coming into UPEI by the farmers market. The problems with those intersections, to a certain extent, is it's just blending. It's like white noise. Yeah. Yeah. You go and activate those pedestrian lights. They're up high. They flash yellow. But as you're coming towards the intersection. You've got a, a light on the island that's flashing yellow. You got an iron over here flashing. So it all just blends in. Yeah. Technologies. I mean, the technological age we're coming into with, with all the contraptions and cars stuff. There's going to be driver intention. That's and then the pedestrian intention. So it's just it's all coming to a bit of a. I find it, I find with the with the manufacturing of vehicles like some of these screens like that's in yeah. cars today like. 
everything is made for you to put your eyes there and not. Oh, that's, that's <laughs> a, it's the, back, the backup cameras. Yeah, the backup. Back before you had one of those, stay home. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah. So, <laughs> there's an just, just to follow up, yeah. sorry, go ahead. There's definitely room for education improvements. And uh, so, you know, we can look at ways of doing that. But, you know, highway safety, the province has a big role in playing that too. But I think, you know, for, as a city and as police service, we can look at ways we can promote, you know, more awareness and, and uh, uh, to some of the issues, but you know, I, or it is a shared responsibility, safety, like just uh, walking across that crosswalk blind and not taking into account your surroundings is, you know, uh, is, gonna, is gonna make you a loser most of the time. And uh, if you're the one hit, it doesn't matter whose fault it is, you're the one going to the hospital. So, you're, and you're right, so on the topic of the the lights and the ones that you say that are ineffective because they kind of blend in. Is there a plan in place to look at problem areas or high, you know, high traffic areas, <clears throat> looking to put the the lower lights yeah, we, in? Like, like Brad said, you know, we've had some discussions with public works, and public works to look at some spots. Not necessarily those right now because it's some other spots like like the Boys and Girls Club. Yeah. Is if we can do something there, let's address that. One. Okay. I mean, we have some things like at the farmers market and that kind of thing. You know, at, at some point in time, it would be why don't you upgrade those and like the the ones they put in by the 1911 jail. When those activate, yeah. they're bright. They catch well, your eye. You shouldn't be missing. So them. you know, <laughs> is that should almost be the standard going forward. Right. And forward. Yeah. So if you can, over time, change your older ones to that type of yeah. system, then you'd be better off for it. But as we're working with them now, identifying spots that really should have something put in place, let's do those. Yeah. So what's the cost associated with those? I, I don't know. That's, uh, that's in Scott's wheelhouse. Okay. Okay. Well, just thousands. Like for the, that one along with the Avenue. But there are other versions for, you know, uh, Maple Avenue, for example, I can do so right there now, Maple. Uh, oh, the stop sign? Yeah, the yeah, stop sign. Yeah, yeah. There's different and versions of, of, you know, but the one at Confederation Jail area, it's a real high volume. Until they have yeah, and, some there are, and that's that's you know, one of the things, like you said, the, the trail yeah. like on Allen Street. Yeah, some of the problem you have there is people run the trail. Yeah, and when they and they just keep on going, they don't, they don't look. They don't. They don't. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. it's not an expensive fix. I we've had occurrences like we have two pedestrian actions at the corner of University and uh, Houston Street. We we're fortunate enough to have a camera there, and we could see what was going on. And some and it was just a small tweak of the timing of the lights, and uh, you know prevented that. And we, and we had not, had, but in the same, this, this, the, you know, it was the factor in both of those, and uh, and um, you know you look at uh, the intersection of University Avenue by Emmett Crescent, where we we had several pedestrian actions there, and uh, you know we we. Put in some measures, and we consulted with public works, made some recommendations, and and that situation has improved. And uh, so, you know, it's uh, sometimes there's, you know, uh, it takes some time to re realize what those changes are. It's not always a high end fix. Sometimes it's just a tweak. Uh, but uh, you know, we'll continue to work with public works to help as best as we can. But as Sean had indicated, technology, you know, and, and especially in those two cases, were were a huge advantage because they they, they tell you what has happened, right? So you can reflect on that. Mm -hmm. And you can monitor on a go-forward basis. So. Yeah. The doctor's name was Dr. David Gass. He was 75 mm -hmm. years old. And he was a uh, professor at Dalhousie Med uh, Medical School. But his accident was the, the driver didn't heal and he hit the pedestrian right away. Mm -hmm. Again, we all have responsibilities. <clears throat> and I know this is a live stream. I'm not saying that it's a pedestrian's fault, it's not the driver. Mm -hmm. We all have a responsibility. Yeah, everyone's right. It's like the Allen Street issue, Allen and Walton. That's more of a lighting issue that's been asked by, I think, the council from the area, more lights. Uh, there by the Upstreet uh, mm. Brewery. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Any other comments, questions on that, Councillor Duran? Any comments, questions? Oh, well, I'm great, thank you. Okay. Is that it for the community policing? Yes, it is. Okay. All right. We get a motion to move into a closed session as per section 119, 1B, E, and H of the MGA. Moved. 